Welcome to the podcast. With me tonight is my friend Susie. Welcome. Thank you. So, how are you? There's a snowstorm outside. Again. Again. Yes. And you just told me that you just ran through like knee high snow. Yeah. Piles to get again. to your friend's house. Yes, again. <laughs> so that's what's going on here. It's funny yes. enough because recent chats we've been having, there's been a storm outside probably half of the time. Yeah, it's news material if there's nothing wrong with the weather. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they recently started this yellow alert and orange alert and red alert in mm -hmm. Iceland. And mm. I think nobody is paying attention anymore because mm. every other day there's a yellow alert. Yes. <laughs> okay. Enough about where, where, where are you born and where do you grow up in Iceland? Um, I was born in Reykjavik. Okay. But I grew up for the first few years in Westman Islands. Okay. And that's where my family's from. And that's a really small place. A really, really small place, yes. But extre extremely beautiful, though. Yeah. Um, but everybody knows everything about everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's, there's about 4,000 people there. Okay. Uh, it used to be three when I lived there, 3,000. And everybody works there. Yes, you everybody. don't have to be old to have started working when you're in Westman Islands. No, I think um, my mom grew up there too, and she started. She had her first. Um, she started working uh, with a fish mm -hmm. when she was eight, mm -hmm. and then uh, she got a a regular steady job at twelve. Yeah, and it sounds kind of terrible, but when you're in there, it's just a tight knit community. Everybody yeah. matters. We're doing stuff and we all just have to help each other. It's more of that than mm -hmm. the way it probably sounds when somebody started working eight. Yeah, but it's uh, all over the world. There, uh, there are a lot of places where, um, where people just chip in with their family. You know, mm -hmm. everybody has, has to work together. And um, I think it's kind of still there yeah. in Westman Islands. So that's, um, I mean, here, the kids shouldn't have to work, you know, but, but there, I think they, they feel the responsibility still to, to chip in. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty healthy when you think about it. And it also kind of doesn't leave you the space of you doing all the wrong things mm -hmm. somehow, because you're you, busy, you have a role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're busy all the time. Yeah. And, and then there's another thing about working outside of Reykjavik in the countryside that usually when you're working, it's fun. People enjoy what they're doing. <laughs> don't worry about it, relax. Okay, <laughs> it's like you got in my no, Don't worry about it. Okay, yeah, um, but I, I, I moved to uh, Reykjavik again when I was um, about five and a half. Okay. And my mom, uh, I lived with my mom and she, she's been there ever since, the same place. So I have this uh, neighborhood that I always consider like home. Okay. Well, and the island. Where where is that? Is it Breholt? Breholt. Yeah. Okay. Which is kind of somehow. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Okay, you're <laughs> sensitive to it. Where are, are you going to say ghetto? It's a running joke oh, somehow yeah, yeah. because and 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 it is a joke because when people in America hear this, they think about a ghetto and it's not the same thing. No, it's not like the project. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> but I think it comes from when they built it. They built a lot of big housing, public housing, and they put them all together somehow. Yeah. And it didn't go too well. And now they started just to... Yeah, it was like a social services project. Mm -hmm. in, and I think 1974, they, they built it for the the volcano eruption in, in Westman Islands, yeah. a lot of it. So, yeah. I mean, and there are a lot of immigrants there still because yeah, the yeah. social services still have a, a lot of apartments there. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of mixed racial and ethnic scene there. So, mm -hmm. Which is not bad. No, no. Definitely. And you grew up there. And, yeah. and how were you, were you as a kid? Because I, I know you and I've spent time with you, but I don't know anything, you know, more, if you know what I mean. Um, I'm just kind of curious. I think people have uh, trouble picturing me as a kid because 
I mean, the stories my mom tells and the way I'm today, it's not, not exactly, no. Well, it doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. So, um, but um, I, was a, I was a quiet kid. My parents used to call me a butterfly because I was always, um, like I got, I got lost on my five minute um, walk to school because I just saw something pretty and just started uh, looking at it and for, kind of forgot I had school. So, <laughs> And I did this again and again, but no surprise, I have uh, ADD, <laughs> which we found out later. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was, I was quiet and I was hardworking. Mm -hmm. I was raised that way. That, um, that, you know, you just, you, you work no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and I was interested in pretty much everything in school and I did good. Um, but then that was when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Then later I turned into a teenager. And that's when, uh, that's when I don't know what to say. Well, the shit hit the fan. The shit hit the fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah, I think we all, and mo the majority of the people I've talked to now have that exact same story. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the eight, I, fuck, I hate acronyms. I cannot remember acronyms in Icelandic or in English. The H, the... The H. ADHD. ADHD. Thank yes. you very much. I think... Every other Icelandic has it. It yes. seems that way. <laughs> maybe just our friends. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe yes. possibly. <laughs> possibly. Um, yeah. So how did that kind of start with you? If you I met to... Glotis. You met Glotis? Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but still, I did. So. <laughs> um, so you were friends back in the day? Yeah. Okay. I didn't even know that. Yeah, since we were like 12 or something. Yeah, okay. So she you, was trouble. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Definitely. Like we all were, I think. And Svantis? Yeah, yeah. No hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you kind of hit that run together. The yes. three of you, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I don't know how deep you want to go in, if you want to go into that at all, but... Sure. Yeah. I just... I, I don't know what's what's um, worth noting and what's yeah, not, you know. Just, we're just having a, having, having a chat about it. Yeah. Because I'm kind of interesting because I've been, the more I talk to people about it, the more I see kind of correlations. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what I am maybe trying to find out is because I have teenagers now and I'm always thinking about how could we do things differently? What, how could I... What are the commonalities? And because they have me as in that, they have my genes, mm -hmm. and they have their mother's genes, and maybe not the best mix going on there because well. we're both in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's why I'm kind of interested in that. Yeah. A little bit. Well, I was very lucky. My parents. Um, well, they're um, like black and white. Mm -hmm. So when. Um, when I was a kid, when I was like uh, one, two years old, they got divorced mm -hmm. and they absolutely didn't get along at okay. all. Um, and I know they were frustrated with each other, but I didn't know it at the time. Mm -hmm. So no matter, um, no matter what went on, they always uh, kept a great relationship. And my mom would like um, say good things about my dad and then she would call him and scream at him, <laughs> but I didn't know that. Yeah. So um, that's cool, though. Yeah, she kind of. I mean, when he when he messed up, she was always there to explain to me why, and uh, and that was pretty great. And I see you do that too with your kids. You try mm -hmm. to strengthen the relationship with. Uh, yeah, it's important. It is, and we still have Christmas together. Mm -hmm. Me, that? my mom, my dad, and whatever girlfriend he has at the time. <laughs> okay, that's super cool. Yeah. He's had the same one for, for years now, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, a little bit of old history dragged into yes. that. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. And, and then you're about 12, and wh how, how does it kind of happen? Where, where, where does it kind of start to go wrong? Uh, I don't know. Was uh, it just 
like seeking for a new adventure, something interesting, something exciting? Or... I think I just, I, I, my mom says I was sad, like from when I was eight or nine. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do remember I had a boyfriend at the time. Okay. And uh, he had older sisters who kind of look, looked up to them. And I think it was just that time that it wasn't that weird to be 12 and... And starting to drink and starting to do yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the same, same with me and it's totally different kind of now. Yeah, when I think about 12-year-old kids doing drugs or, or drinking, it's absurd, but I don't know. I guess it's, it's the same with every kid. They, they always feel like they're so grown yeah. up. And yeah, yeah, it probably happens still, but it was yeah. not as common as it was back in the day. Yeah. Which, which is super good. Mm -hmm. and but my boyfriend, he was... Uh, uh, we started smoking together. And... I do remember the first time. Mm -hmm. I remember saying no because um, I heard my mom's voice, like, you should always say no to drugs and, and all that. So I, I definitely knew I shouldn't be doing that. But mm -hmm. I think I got the question, the offer, at exactly the, the point I was feeling, why not? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't feel like it could get any worse. Mm -hmm. So I think that played a, a big part because, I mean, if I was happy and, and fulfilled, I, I probably wouldn't have sacrifice anything you know mm -hmm. but it, w it was it's exactly the same for me because i i was brought up that way you shouldn't go that route and nothing good will come out of that and i had strong opinions about that mm -hmm. and exactly the same thing just mm -hmm. the right place i had the offer and i was like oh why the fuck not mm -hmm. and on that exact moment everything was kind of okay i just wanted to check it all out yeah. Was it the same for you? <laughs> I seriously thought from the the first time I thought I was never going to do it again. It was just to try. But then the next day I thought, well, I, I mean, nothing horrible happened. So <laughs> I should try again. And yeah. then um, yeah, then I just did it every day. Yeah. Right away. So. Yeah, it was this probably a similar start with, a, with both you and me. Just yeah. when you kind of crossed that, it was... Game on. <laughs> yeah, and, and before you know it, everything's a mess. Mm -hmm. I was kicked out of my soccer team, and because um, apparently you can't show up high to practices. <laughs> I don't know who made that rule, but um, then um, yeah, then I just I don't know. I I started. I, I became a whole different person. I mean, mm -hmm. I was I was not playing video games with my friends anymore and collecting you know Pokemon cards and and, and that you know, but. I had um, a whole new interest. Mm -hmm. so. and, and was it was because and then kind of you isolate yourself from the family and that kind of thing. Was it the same for you? Were you just kind of on the run from your mom because mm. you felt guilty because that was my experience? Not right away. I was a pretty good liar. Yeah. Yeah. For, you get away with it for some years. Yeah. And I, 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 I kind of lied to myself too that I mean, I couldn't tell her, mm -hmm. obviously, because she would probably think I had a problem, mm -hmm. which I didn't. No, of course not. So I just decided not to tell anybody, and I convinced myself that if I could, if I could um, fool them into having like a normal life, then it wasn't that messed up. My life wasn't so messed up that, um, I mean, I, I'm, I had some control, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, but I think I was 15 or 16 when, when I started moving out and going away and, and just disappearing. And, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's probably similar. I, mean, I, I remember I found this notebook I had back in the day and I was obviously obsessed with it <laughs> because the stuff I wrote in there is successful living through chemistry and <laughs> all kinds of stupid shit. And, and I, I wasn't doing anything, mm. but I was absolutely convinced that I was going places. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> the rock star life without the rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, just around the corner. Yeah. Somebody's waiting for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> That's funny how that works. But then, then of course, this stuff just kind of catches up, and and kind of the reality becomes uglier somehow. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. But I've I've always been a optimist, mm-hmm. which is great now. But then, I mean, being optimistic while using, it kind of just. Um, I mean, I was like, everything's fine, everything's great, and I, I believed it. Mm-hmm. So I think my optimism now used to be my denial back then. So. Yeah, it's funny how that works because it's the same element kind of working within. Yeah, I still do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I still, I still say everything's fine, mm-hmm. you're going to do this, everything's great. Um, but that was like s- sick. Yeah. And how many years did you spend in that place? What place? The using place. And kind of, how did you get out and, um, and, and how many years did you spend there? Kind of. Uh, I, I, I started trying to quit when I was 16, I think. Um, and I went to detox for the first time at 17. Mm-hmm. And by that time I was I mean, I, I couldn't wait to get out of my mom's house, so um, just to be like free. Mm-hmm. But it took me three months to really want to go back to her. Okay. And she said, um, you can come back when you finish rehab. And I was always trying to negotiate with her, like, I can go for detox for 10 days. Well, what if I stay for 16 days? Well, what if I see a therapist too? So I was always <laughs> trying, to, trying to get away with like as much as little as I could Mm -hmm. um but she wouldn't take me back so and I wasn't ready to to give up completely so uh I think I went to detox like four times and um rehab twice or something Mm -hmm. and the detox thing in Iceland is kind of just 10 days at a yeah kind of a hospital and then therapy is a month deal somehow yeah um I've been in detox for, once I went for 10 days, I've also been in for 20, 21 day. Okay. And I've also, um, like the rehabs I've been to is um, mm-hmm. which is, it's like three to six months, but I was only there for, for a month. Oh, is, is Klagerakot that long? I didn't know that. Yeah, you can stay as long as you need. Okay. And if you're serving a sentence, you can... You can extradite. I mean, you can extend the the stay yeah. even even longer. But I was only there for a month. Yeah. And uh, the other rehab too, uh, a month. And did that? Did you find something through that, or 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 was that later that something changed? I don't know. I was always kind of waiting for this. I heard stories that people had to go through something awful and then start, you know, they find their rock bottom, you know, and then. I heard stories like, I went to a meeting once and, and there was a woman and she was like, I was driving the company truck and then I, I rolled it over and everything was a mess and that's when I hit rock bottom and now I've been clean for 12 years or something. And I was waiting for that story, but I never had a story like that. So <laughs> I was like, uh, I hit rock bottom and then two steps ahead and then three steps backwards. And I was like, it was a bumpy road. And I kind of realized when I got clean now in 2012, I realized that I, I really didn't need a story because I was fed up and nothing really happened. Mm-hmm. I think it was a, it was like a emotional thing I was waiting for, not a, a material thing. Mm-hmm. It's funny how that works though, because I think this is a common misunderstanding that you, you need that big moment. Yeah. When it's not at all about that it's more about what do you do when you come there when yeah. you arrive yeah and i was so arrogant i was i was too smart for my own good and that that was my problem for a long time i, I probably wouldn't i probably would have done this when i was 16 if i had if i could just believe that somebody else had a better way than i did but yeah. that was so hard because <laughs> i was like I'm still like, if, if somebody says, this is not going to work, it's broken. I'm still going to shake and try, you know, I'm very stubborn. 
So it's very hard to take somebody else, else's word. Mm -hmm. And that's arrogance. So when, if, if, I, if I was a little bit less arrogant when I was 16, I would have made it then. Yeah, but I think we're all that way, kind of. Yeah, and I learned a lot doing the shitload of mistakes I did mm -hmm. uh, last, last years. But I think I was, I was using, I mean, it was only eight years, eight, nine years maybe. And uh, well, next March I'll be nine years. No, I'll be eight years clean. Okay. So I'm almost. Um, I'm almost at that. 50, that milestone. Spot. Yeah. 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 That's that's a cool spot. I remember when I hit that. And it kind of felt weird because first year you're all excited, and the second year you're all excited, mm -hmm. and then it kind of just is a normal thing. Yeah. But. The next big thing is kind of that halfway place. Mm -hmm. Well, and and this year f at f uh, 420, mm -hmm. me and Arnar will have 18 years together between us. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's kind of cool. It's very cool. And, and it's funny because now you talk about some Glotis and, and, and Santis and you both are, and you're all kind of together again. In yeah. a different place in life. Yeah. Which is super cool too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> our friends are either there waiting, mm -hmm. using, or dying, mm -hmm. or dead, you know. So it's, uh, I mean, there's not a lot of ways to go. Mm -hmm. So we're probably going to meet them somewhere along the way. Yeah, usually it goes that way. Yeah. But like you said, but. You also lose a lot of friends along the way mm -hmm. in, in this situation. We were talking about this earlier. Yeah. When you were talking about your friend who was going to her first funeral. Yeah, at 27 mm -hmm. years. Yeah. I just, I never realized because yeah. all my friends, they were always seeing somebody's funeral, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So it's a serious deal. Yeah. And you kind of get, I'm not you kind of get used to it somehow in a sad way it's mm -hmm. normal somehow yeah saying good goodbye to friends in a way yeah and i try to i mean sometimes when somebody dies i get upset and then i think you should be used to this by now mm -hmm. but i'm kind of glad that i still get upset you know because yeah of course i'm not that um numb mm -hmm. yet i guess i mean should be glad to feel that pain still so yeah definitely but when you had some years clean you got another disease right yeah i remember because i kind of watched that from from afar somehow mm -hmm. and i thought it was super cool how you kind of dealt with that well yeah <laughs> okay um so 2017 I was five years clean mm -hmm. and it was funny it was the same in March 2017 I was five years clean mm -hmm. and I remember thinking I should get life insurance now because I, I just passed my five year milestone mm -hmm. which means I can get life insurance okay and like insurance for diseases and stuff and three weeks later I was diagnosed with cancer so you were right Three on Three week window, yeah. <laughs> I was on my way, you know, and it, I mean, I would be, I would be loaded right now. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> if I just done it. Because, <laughs> I mean, the odds, like your, your life is just getting going and then bam, mm -hmm. <laughs> here's cancer. That must have been super fucking hard though. Well, yeah, but I mean, I'm kind of messed up though. I'm... I mean, everybody was like, oh, you're so brave, you're so um, optimistic and positive and stuff. But I was like, no, I'm, I'm just emotionally fucked up. Because I, I was, I actually went to this therapist that they, uh, they offered me, the mm -hmm. um, Krafter. Mm -hmm. They offered me the, uh, a, a psychologist. And I went there and he was like, how can I help you? And I was like, um, I was just diagnosed with cancer and I'm fine. And he was like, okay, so, so how can I help you? What, what's the problem? I was just diagnosed with cancer <laughs> and I'm fine. <laughs> so can you help me? 
And he didn't know what to say. He was like, that's usually not how things go. I mean, people come here terrified. And I was like, yeah, there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I don't feel anything. I'm not surprised. I'm not angry. I'm just, can we just get this shit over with? <laughs> you know, can we, just, can we just push through this so I can start like going to school again? And like, I don't have time for this. <laughs> so um, I actually just, I think I just started getting in touch with those feelings like uh, six weeks ago. Okay. Usually after a trauma, it takes me about a year and a half to experience it. Okay. Which is, I, I know, I know, I know it's there. So every time I say to some people and, and myself that I'm fine, I actually, like when I was diagnosed, I really started trying to cry, you know, because that was, everybody was saying, it's normal to cry. <laughs> So I was like, okay, I gotta do this. Let's cry now. Because, <laughs> I mean, I had to, I knew it was healthy. The, the healthy thing was to get in touch with my feelings and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to do that, but it's like, um, it's not a tough guy act or something. It's, it's really, it's just, it's just, um, I think it's just automatic by now. Mm -hmm. so, so what I, what I noticed though, that you were pretty out there with it. Yeah. When you when you were going through it, and that was that was the thing that I found extremely cool because you were a young person and you were out there with it, mm -hmm. and and you were in in the media and you were doing video clips and stuff, mm -hmm. and I I I my thinking was this: okay, she's helping a lot of people, kind of dealing with this. I hope so. Yeah. Because I, I really hate being in the media. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what was your thinking about it when you kind of did that? Well, I mean, it's like the, the, the other disease, the addiction. Mm -hmm. I needed somebody else's ex experience to get through it. And um, when I was diagnosed, I, I started looking at, you know, videos and other... I was going to a PET scan in Denmark I had to, to go there and I had no idea what I was in for okay and I just saw this couple in snapchat um, I, I don't know even I don't even know why I had them there but they were there and they were like the same week I was diagnosed I was watching them sharing their experience in Denmark at the PET scan and I was so grateful because it's not like there was a pamphlet here. Like, mm -hmm. this is what's going to happen. It, there, there wasn't anything like that. So it helped me a lot to see what they were going through because I was going there the, the next week. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I met this girl. Uh, she was a 30-year-old widow. Her, her husband had um, a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to her, because she helped me a lot, she helped me understand a lot and how to deal with my family. And I remember saying, I'm sorry that your husband died and I think it's very shitty, mm -hmm. but I'm so grateful you have this experience for me. And I realize how selfish that sounds, <laughs> but like it's, it's a shitty thing that you lost your husband. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's kind of nice mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean uh, it I, sounds awful but I, I needed somebody yeah and I, I, I bet you did she didn't feel it that way no no <laughs> no no she knew what I meant yeah definitely and so I just I just kind of wanted to use my thing maybe to help somebody but this is something that I that I pretty often wondered about mm -hmm. it, it's one thing kind of getting this disease and dealing with that then dealing with having conversations with other people. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of difficult also? People kind of feeling awkward or feeling... Well, you can have fun with that. Okay. <laughs> Tell so, me about that. I mean, I think nobody knows what to say. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just... Um, I mean, I made jokes a lot. I was like blackmailing my mom 
emotionally. I was like, you got to do this for me, mom. Like, I got cancer. <laughs> so I was kind of milking it, just like joking about it. Because, I mean, what else are you going to do? And um, Artnar, uh-huh. we were friends back then. Yeah. And I just called him and said, like, I got to go to this retreat and I need somebody to go with me. And come on, man, I have cancer. <laughs> and he was the first one. So, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're not going to play this card with me. And then he hung up and I was like, what? <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> and I think I just I just did it a lot with my friends. So they would like, uh, I don't know, they got pretty comfortable with it. OK, it's a clever way of doing it. Yeah. I mean, but it's it still kind of fun to like... Um, like, hey, uh, nice to meet you. Fun fact, I have cancer. <laughs> and like, I, I mean, people get so shocked. I kind of like that. I have no shame. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a good icebreaker, though. Yeah. Which kind of cancer did you get? What? Lymphoma. Lymphoma. Yeah. Okay. And Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay. Uh, Chinese for me. Yes, uh, blood cancer. Blood cancer. Yes. Okay. And how are the odds in this when you get this kind of thing? I wouldn't know. It's a rare, very rare okay. variant. So I have no idea. I've never heard of anyone who has, like, I can trace the story. Like, yeah, that happened yeah. to me. And then, okay, I know what to expect. There's, there's no, like, reported case that's exactly like mine. Okay. But there are a few, I mean, there are people around the world that have this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just joined a Facebook community like with people all over the world. But we don't, I mean, I have a, a specialist in Sweden. And he's not even a specialist. You know, he's just, he's yeah. dealt with this before. Um, there's another girl in Iceland and I know that has, um, I mean, the same name. Mm-hmm. But it's very different though. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not, there's not a, there's not a how-to manual. No. Not for me or the doctors or anybody. So everybody's just like scratching their head and like, oh, we'll just do, try to find out and Google this shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me check here on Google real quick. <laughs> yeah, so, so the prognosis, I mean, when I was first diagnosed, I had these, um, I had these little red, I, I was just, I had redness in my skin, just like I had um, sunburn, mm-hmm. just a little spot on my arm. And I never, I mean, it was my mom. She was like, you have to go to the doctor. And I don't really like going to the doctors. <laughs> um, and I had been to the doctors before and he was like, oh, there's nothing wrong. This is eczema or whatever. It's just a rash. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. But then three years, it was still there. Mm-hmm. And my mom was like, you got to go again. Cause I was getting sick. I was, I had fever and stuff. And she, she said, please one more time for me. And I was like, okay, mom. And then I'm done. Mm-hmm. Like you can let this go. There's nothing wrong with me. Um, but then this, I think it was the fifth or sixth doctor I saw. She wanted to take like, um, a biopsy Yeah. and she did. And I mean, it, it's a red rash it's like sunburn or you know when you when you put your elbow down Mm -hmm. and then you look at it and i mean how could that be cancer how could that be blood cancer Mm -hmm. i never expect and i i don't have anxiety regarding my health thank god i think that's (laughs) actually worse than (laughs) having a health problem but (laughs) but um then i got the phone call like two weeks later and she was like yeah uh about that biopsy you gotta go to the hospital right now (laughs) okay um and then um I mean, I went there, there were a few doctors there. They, they had no idea what was going on. They were actually Googling shit in front of me. <laughs> They're like, hang on. <laughs> I, I have a few questions. Yeah, what's the first question? Okay, hang on. And then they went to the computer and I was like, are you serious? <laughs> but I know they were trying their best, but they never dealt with this before. They never, they, they never had a patient like this before. Mm-hmm. So okay. I was always waiting for to be the special one, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got my, so got I, got, I got my wish. Yeah. I was discovered <laughs> meant for great things, you know? Well, um, well, then, then I was told that, um, like 90% of the people that had this, um, would never, they would always be on stage one. Okay. You know, the, the classic four stages, they would always be on stage one. They would die with the disease, not because of it. Mm-hmm. And I probably, I probably 
wouldn't have to worry about it because I would just, I, I, they scheduled for me um, a UVA light therapy, mm -hmm. which is pretty weird because they were like telling me to go tanning. <laughs> My mom kept telling me, don't go tanning, you know, <laughs> but then I was, okay. And they said, usually it goes like, you, you get the, you get the rashes, mm -hmm. then you, you go to the, to the light therapy. Mm -hmm. It's called phototherapy for, I don't know, three months, and then you're clear. And maybe it comes back, maybe it doesn't, and if it does, you just do the thing again. Okay. And I was like, okay, it sounds easy enough, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, what happens to the 10%? And she was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but later that year, six months later, I kind of found out, because I had a, a tumor in my, um, in a lift tissue, lymph t tissue. Uh, under here mm -hmm. and I couldn't feel it it was like I thought I thought cancer was pretty basic mm -hmm. I mean the TV thing you find something here or in your throat or something but what what is this why <laughs> <laughs> I mean why didn't I get information about this in school um, so then I had to go the do the whole chemo radiation thing with the, the the hair and the puking and the stuff you know that must have been pretty hard I yeah. couldn't believe I was gonna be that lady the lady I saw on TV, mm -hmm. the lady I was like, oh, poor thing, you know, I, I couldn't believe that was going to be me. And I was determined I was not going to be sick and white and bald. <laughs> I was going to do something great. Yeah. <laughs> and I was going to push through, and I did. I graduated, um, I graduated school, and I finished, um, I graduated as a LPN, too. Mm -hmm. I sh probably should have slowed down a little bit, but I still haven't. That's not quite you, though. No. <laughs> and I'm kind of paying the price right now. Like I said, in December, I started experiencing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there's a thing called cancer-related fatigue. Okay. Have you heard of it? I have never heard about it. You know what fatigue is? Yep. Fatigue is like, uh, it's like tiredness, but it's, it's worse. It's, like, uh, it's a symptom of many diseases. Like if you have, if you have the flu, mm -hmm. fatigue is a symptom. Yeah. Like, Okay, so when they told me cancer makes you tired, you're mm -hmm. gonna have fatigue. I was like, yeah, duh. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. But I didn't know there was something later. Yeah. You know, I, I finished treatment. I finished uh, my radiation and chemo like almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. So I should be fine, you know. Uh, but uh, nobody told me about this. And apparently it's quite common that people just um, keep going. Yeah. Graduate this and graduate that and keep working and uh, hit a wall, mm -hmm. which is kind of what I did. Um, and they even have an app for it. They have an app for yeah, it? Yeah, there's actually a guy somewhere in the world <laughs> or a girl that made an app called Beating Cancer Related Fatigue. It's a thing. Okay. So I'm doing like this cheesy exercises every day, like That's meditation, breathing, doing squats, like 10 and they say no more they're always uh, preventing me from doing more <laughs> and when i when i try to <clears throat> when i try to take like when i'm finished and i'm empowered and i'm i'm, I'm gonna do tomorrow's job too mm -hmm. they say no <laughs> you have to stop you cannot open it's not accessible <laughs> until tomorrow you have to stop so i, I that's kind of great i'm not the only one though that's so, so. funny though yeah <laughs> My mom is the exact same way. She never stops. A trooper. Yeah. Yeah. That's how, how it goes. Some. And, and how, like, oh, I lost my words. I got no words now. <laughs> <laughs> and so you got, got through all the chemo you got through and now you're dealing with this fatigue. You're, you're also studying though. You're also in. Well, I still have cancer. You still have cancer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it came back, like, I finished treatment in April 2018. Uh-huh. And a month later, it came back. Okay. But, I mean, I, I've had to do a biopsy, like, every two months. Okay. So and they didn't see anything. Mm-hmm. But then, in December, uh, they diagnosed me again. Okay. So I'm, I'm doing the phototherapy thing again. Okay. But, I mean, I'm, my health is pretty good. Okay, so you're not feeling the same. No, I think it's just. I mean, my body's fine. Mm -hmm. 
it's the it's kind of like um, emotional exhaustion thing. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll work through it. I know you will. <laughs> <laughs> And it's kind of my own fault. I mean, I'm 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 in college now. Yeah. And and working. And I have disability and I have two doctors telling me to stop doing both. Mhm. Mm but what do they know? <laughs> Probably just google it. <laughs> yeah. I learned a long time ago that my way is the best way, right? <laughs> yeah. Of course. Yeah, I know about this, but I, I, because my wife has been doing the same thing, working and doing cards, and it's it's a motherfucker. Yeah, it's gonna catch up to you. Yeah, definitely. So, I'm just hoping it'll catch up to me this summer. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep swimming. <laughs> 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 I just gotta get through my final exams, and then I'm gonna work on the mental health thing. You know, in the summer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're doing that this summer. It's on yeah, the schedule. Like, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll rest later. <laughs> uh, you're studying to be a nurse, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why that? Why become a? Where did that come from? I don't did you know. Always know or? I don't know how I got here. No. Like, I was a drug addict, mm -hmm. and then I was a cancer patient, and now I'm trying to be a nurse. I don't know. I don't know how I got here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there was never this. It was not like uh, what I always wanted or something. I've always been going this way and this is what I've always wanted. It's like I just I just made some decision mm -hmm. and I took some path and then I took another one and here I am. But I think I, I think I wanted to I don't want to be a doctor. Um, but it seems I'll, easy though if you have Google now. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I mean, I got that covered, so I should be studying something else. Yeah. Um, I think I want to help people, and I think that's the, the, the one reason that everybody has in common that studies this. And we have an epidemic here in Iceland right now with addicts mm -hmm. and addiction, and the doctors can't help. I mean, they can they can help with the physical thing, mm -hmm. but there's nothing they can do. There's not a pill for it. Mm -hmm. There's not a prescription. There's nothing they can do to to fix this. And um, I think nurses and and any caregiver in Iceland they have a greater role than they realize. Definitely. Because I remember waking up at a hospital, and I mean. People just look down at you. And I don't know if anything would change if nurses and nursing staff, if they had um, a different attitude. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I want to try it. I definitely think that is, that is key, definitely. And th I think this is the next big thing we should be kind of concentrating on. Yeah, so I, I, I want to get a degree now, and mm -hmm. then I want to go to get a master's degree. And then a doctorate, which is going to take a lot of years. But I want to do research mm -hmm. uh, on how this could help, because there, there. I mean, you've heard of the the rat, the rat city. Mm -hmm. That's all about community and and, and attitude and um, society helping you and supporting you. Mm -hmm. And I think there's got to be more you can do. Definitely, definitely. And I think there is a shift going on everywhere, mm -hmm. just about the attitude about this. Yeah. And I think this war on drugs thing was just poison to my ears. I think that is just kinda, say no to drugs. Yeah, I think this 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 thing is going away. Mm -hmm. I I hope at least. It, I hope so. It seems to be kind of everybody is getting on the same page. This is not working. We need to do something else. Yeah, that's the thing. I've been bitching about it for years, mm -hmm. and. I think I just when I when I sign up for for the university mm -hmm. I think I was just gonna like if they're not gonna do anything I'm just gonna do it myself that was kind of my attitude and and I have like 15 year plan okay like I want to start a company mm -hmm. uh, a private company with maybe some government 
um, involvement. Mm -hmm. But we have the longest waiting list here for treatment. And if you, if you had to sell your house to get your kid in rehab, would you? Definitely. Sure. So we don't have that option here. We no. have the public system. Mm -hmm. We have, I mean, it's great. It's free. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, it's accessible for everybody. Mm -hmm. But shouldn't we have the option to sell our house for our kid if we, if we want to? I mean, I don't like the, 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 the private thing or the public thing. I, I mean, we should be, just be working together. But to tell somebody there's a 900 people waiting list, so you're going to be, you just got to stay alive for like a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not always the case. Yeah, but is there anything I can do? Can mm -hmm. I do something? No. Definitely. No. Also, it's just, it's, it's, and that's where it kind of gets messy also because mm -hmm. Helping an addict that's not ready, it's <laughs> it's tough yeah. because because we're usually stubborn fuckers and mm -hmm. we definitely go our own way no matter what. Yeah. So that, that's the tricky situation about it. Mm -hmm. But I totally agree. You should have options. Yeah, and if funding is the problem, mm -hmm. why can't we fund it ourselves then? Mm -hmm. We should be able to. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah, it's. I've admired all the things that you have been doing because I have seen you're doing a lot to help other people everywhere where you go, and that's kind of why I wanted to talk to you. And it's also what I wanted. I kind of wanted to. I knew why you became a nurse, or I thought I knew, <laughs> and I I definitely did. And it's just fun to hear it from you because you have this cool view of if things are not changing, I should be the one doing it. Yeah, I'm very decisive mm -hmm. and stubborn. Yeah. I'm trying to make it work for my favor. Yeah. In my favor. Yeah. And and I've also seen you're you're good at working with other people and you're good at kind of feeding the positivity that we need to do mm. stuff like this. And I used to be. Well, like I said, I've been tired, so I. I, you, I think you. I think you judge yourself too hard. You're definitely still doing it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> or at least when you when when you're looking at it from not your point of view, <laughs> you I'm, see it. <laughs> it's actually kind of good to hear because I've been feeling like a shitty person for like two months because I've yeah. been neglecting my friends for for school and pretty much neglecting everything. <laughs> and I can definitely say that all of. All the people that I know that are doing things with you, we see it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But I think, yeah, it's been very fun to talk to you. And I thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Because you have, a, you have a big story. And I definitely see you going places. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>